It's Thursday. It's Thursday. Oh, oh goodness. I think I'm live. Yeah, yeah, yay. Hello, hello. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Oh, goodness. There we are. Yes, I am live. So greetings. Happy Thursday to each of you. Well, to you in particular. <laughs> I am so, you know, Thursdays, I'm so pumped. Anyway, um, I get to talk to Dr. Brown on Thursdays at 11 o'clock. I get to talk to you first thing in the morning. I get to listen to myself on WOVU um, later on this afternoon. Thursdays are always like, yay, 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 yay. And as Winnie would say, it is Friday Eve. <laughs> So I am good. I got my cup of coffee here. I did not get a chance to drink um, any more than two sips of this so far because, um, you know, my this morning, I was just determined to sit a certain amount of time in, um, in meditation and so I did, and it was good. It was good. It was good. Good morning, Ruth. Um, yes, it's a new month, September 1st. Yay! <laughs> and, you know, and it's funny the things that, um, that are a celebration. Because, um, you know, my mother, I remember, what's up, Everett? Oh, hey, 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 greatest morning to you as well. Um, welcome back. I haven't seen you in, um, in a week. <laughs> and uh, I know you may pop off of here, but um, it's so good, so good to, to see you anyway. My mother, when we were younger, used to say that the older you get, the faster time flies. And I, you know, I didn't have a concept of that, you know, because uh, I was whatever age I was, and I couldn't imagine time being any different than um, what it was. And, um, and so I, you know, I was in this space where, um, where I was just doing, you know, I was just doing me. I was just doing the, um, just doing the stuff that younger people do at the time. And so I had no concept or no, uh, no like thing about how fast time went or anything else like that. And so when she would say that, I would just think like, mm, you know, that's, that's an old people speak kind of thing. At the time I was thinking that. Now that I'm the age that my mother was when she passed, it is like, it does seem like you turn around and real quick is another month is gone. And you feel as if um, I don't want to say I'm running out of time because I, you know, sometimes I just feel like I'm at that juicy stage in my life. You know, that, ooh, that, that don't you worry about a thing stage in my life, right? All of it will be good. All of it is just amazing and good. Um, yeah, it's all amazing and good. So I just got a text um, from Dr. Brown and I, you know, I don't know if he knows my hours, but I, I have a hard time doing a couple of things at once. So I don't know that I can answer him. Y'all, I, so, oh, there's so much. There's so much, so much, so much. Um, I want to jump into this, this piece and portion of the book where we are still talking about success and, um, and this family history thing. But then also, um, there is a part of me that wants to, and I think that I'm going to, yesterday when I was um, editing the show that Dr. Brown and I did, um, for last week, I had brought up this book 
um, by Ilhan Omar. And you know, I, I, I think that books are awesome and that we, I'm, I'm including myself, we wouldn't rewrite them if we didn't feel as if we had something significant to say. And so Ilhan Omar, who is Congresswoman, um, oh, she was a Palestinian refugee, um, I think. Um, anyway, she is Muslim and she wears a hijab and um, she, she's Congress. And so she wrote this book um, entitled, This is What America Looks Like. And, you know, it, I, I read a lot of books and not all of them are memorable or life-changing or helps you get a, um, a better vision of yourself. Not all of them do that. But Ilhan Omar was really, um, there was this one section that she got into and she started talking about um, you know, she needed a break because, you know, she felt as if the world was coming down on her. And oftentimes we, you know, as humans uh, um, in this day and time, we get overwhelmed with our lives. As a matter of fact, um, there are some people who cannot find themselves in the center of it because we're so busy with other things and other people and their interests and work and family. And we're, it, it, it's like that, um, we're constantly trying to juggle and somebody else is throwing another ball into the juggle. And, and so it feels like that sometimes. And so she was in one of those moments and she said she just needed to get away. And so um, she needed to get out of the, the whole everything about this. And so she took this trip to Sweden to visit her family. And her family, you know, part of her family was saying, oh, you don't want to go over there and visit them. Those people are like Orthodox Muslims. And so they are really strict and they do this and they do that. And, you know, and it was, they were just making it seem like you ain't ready for that level of, of, of Muslim worship and all of that stuff. They was like, you ain't ready for that. So you shouldn't go over there. But she was like, she just needed a break. And so this was some place that she could go and just take a break from all of this. I, I can't imagine um, her life here because as you know, there are people who are, so against um, some of the, well, I, I forget what they call that, um, uh, it's Ilhan Omar and um, the a AOC, um, all of them together. Anyway, um, she just needed to get away. So what she did was is she went to Sweden and she, you know, because her she could stay with her family for free, she went over there and that was what she did. And so she was surprised because, you know, she was talking about they never asked about, you know, her family or what was going on here in the States. They didn't ask her about her situation, her husband, her baby. They didn't ask her any questions. And so she was kind of like tripping on that, right? Because usually that's what you do when you play catch up, you know, that's what you do. She says, as a matter of fact, you know, they didn't ask her any questions. She goes to bed and she goes to sleep. And she says, and when she wakes up, she realizes that she done woke up and it's, you know, it's into the morning, like not. So she had missed like morning prayer or something. And so while she's like feeling bad about this, she goes back and she, I, I guess what she finally does is she has um, a conversation about them, with them about this. And it's, it's, it's really interesting, the conversation that she had. Um, she says, her cousin said to her, if God wanted you to wake up for prayer, he'd have woke you up. 
And if you don't, that's your answer to God. And so she says, our letting you sleep is the good deed because when God judges us, we're not going to be asked about your prayer. We're going to be asked about how we cared for you. Now, I, I will tell you, that was like, um, you know, a lot of times what we see people do is, is we want to police everybody else. We want to police our neighbors. We want to police the church folk. We want to police our pastor. We want to always be involved and have some kind of say so in what other people do. We even police ourselves to that extent, to some extent, right? And so there's always this judgment about the things that you do, rather than letting them be what they are, letting them be enough. And she said, um, she says, up until that moment, my main experience with religious people was they're trying to give me a hard time about why I wasn't more religious. So she says that her cousin, Alea, opened her mind to a radically different concept of what it meant to be devout. She says, I discovered a solidly internal definition that rests on the care of one's own spiritual well-being and nothing else. Yeah. Ah, man, commenting that someone didn't pray enough or dress modestly or was born um, out of was born out of insecurity. Those kind of comments, they're born out of some insecurity. A healthy religious practice is for you and you alone. And so while like a lot of times what we do is, is we share, like for me, I share my process, right? I, a lot of times when I get up in the morning and I do a lot of stuff, I want to journal, I want to do my Course in Miracles lesson, I want to read my daily word, and then I sit on the, on the, um, on my cushion and do my meditation. If I wanted to collapse all of that down, I would tell you that meditation is the most important thing that I do during the course of the day, right? But that's my process. I can't tell somebody else about what their process is because we're always in our divine right space. Let me say that again. We are always in our divine right space. Stop beating yourself up. Stop worrying about what other people think, what somebody else says. I, you know, I used to tell folks that I'm like this, I got my own atmosphere. I got my own atmospheric pressure. I got my own stuff going on without all of this other stuff. So if I am taking care of me and my stuff, I don't have time to sit up and try to monitor or worry about what you do or you don't do do it or do it not, right? I, my responsibility is to show up and do what Sandra does. So it becomes this thing, even as we do this work, this work, um, this book, as wonderful as I say it is, right? Mark Wolin's, it didn't start with you. This was his journey. It was him finding himself waking up one day without sight and trying to figure out what's going on with me right? Not trying to go over here and fix everybody else. It's what's going on with me. And that's ultimately what we all have to do all the time. What's going on with me, right? And so if, if what we find out in here is, is, this, is that, that how you are is impacted by those that are in your, like in your I'll, I'll use atmosphere, right? Because I know that I've got my ancestors that walk with me, right? But now, even as I found out that, I'm like saying, I'm snatching back my power and saying, you know what? I got this. Thank you very much. I have, you know, I've been carrying my stuff and your stuff. I got this. Thank you very much, right? 
So now, like when I see that, you know, if it's my mother's stress or my mother's worry, or if it's my dad and his, you know, whatever my dad's stuff is, right? His criticism, his critiques, whatever that is. Once I, once I understood that and I found out because Mark Wolin told me, he was like, you can turn around and you can say to these people, this energy, because, because, you know, our ancestors, they don't, we want to think that they are dead and gone, but in reality, they, their energy is still at play in our life. And once we find that out, we can pick and choose like, like, like running a relay race, right? I can reach back for that baton and say, you know what? I got it. I'm going to carry this the rest of the way and keep moving. But sometimes it's like, I, you know what, I, I, uh, you know what, I'm gonna get you on next lap, right? What, <laughs> I'm, I, and I'm good for saying, what's that? What's that? What you about to give me, right? Let me see how I can work it into what I already got going on. Let me see where I can, where I can fit this in. Cause I know, I know that there are things that you know, for all of us, even, even my parents and for me, we come into this world with something that we want to accomplish, something that we feel that we must. My book is in me. My book is coming out through me. And so I know that this is a work that I must do. All of us got to find out the work that we must do. But just sitting up with some some anxiousness, worried about this and worried about, I got work to do. I got work to do. And so I've been busy doing that. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for it that I have been, you know, like when I look over the, the course of my life, when I talk to people, when, um, you know, I, and I think I said the other day, a friend of mine, um, I, I got a friend of mine that is um, in hospice unfortunately. And um, uh, um, another friend who I had introduced, she was talking about, you know what? She was like, you are always connecting people, right? Always. I'm always the one that invite people into my life and I help make connections. I, cause I don't feel like that it's just about me. It's I'm a conduit for something, right? And so if I recognize that I do that, I don't, I'm not sitting up worrying about, you know, oh, this, uh, somebody going to get something I don't have or whatever. What's for me is for me. And what's for you is for you. Nobody can block your good except you. And so when we, when we come to this awareness and, um, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, when we come to this awareness, we, I tell you, it's a powerful thing. Uh, it's a powerful thing. Uh, let me see if I can just, um, let's see. Um, so here, let's, um, let's pick up here where we left off before. <laughs> yeah. This thing about, um, I think about our rejected parents and um, we can repeat our rejected parents' life experience. Uh, because it, it, here, here's the thing. We already determined that when we cut off ourselves from our parents, we cut off a piece um, or we cut off our life force energy. If you can imagine that that umbilical cord that was attached to you was cut, but, but yet and still there is an energy that even though it has been severed, it's still like you are still powered by uh, an energy force that comes to you. Um, whether it is a tangible connection or not, that is still like an energy force that feeds and, and supports you. 
So when we talk about this cutting ourselves off, whether our connection to our parents is severed or whether we're mad at them or whatever the reason, when we cut ourselves off, we, we cut ourselves off from some vital energy. So, so he talks about this, this, this inability to order and to succeed in our lives without this. Now, you have to determine for yourself what success is because sometimes people will have outward success and be miserable as hell on the inside. Um, you will have the trappings that people believe that you're supposed to have and yet still feel empty. And so you got to figure out what it means to you to be successful, right? Because because some of y'all, if y'all were living my life, you would be thinking like, oh my God, I couldn't live like that. But me, it's like, you, I don't know. I got, I got some freaking joy that is makes me want to levitate, you know? So, so you got to figure out what that means for you. So when, when you're considering this, right, um, you got to go for and aim towards your own definition, not looking over to your left, over to your right, trying to figure out what somebody else got going, what they're doing. And if I could just get a step ahead, or if I could just get this, or if I could just get that, that you will be okay. Um, uh, a mate is not going to make you. And I always tell people, be happy where you are with what you have. Work on that, right? Don't think that it's going to be the external stuff that makes you happy. Happiness is an inside job. Work with where you are with what you have. Not when you lose 20, 30 pounds, not when you get another degree or another certification, not when somebody looks at you and says you're the one. No, right? This is an inside job. Now, then when you get happy, right? That means that you're working on your stuff, not, not somebody else's, not your happiness being defined by how many people, you know, tune in or how many people give you a thumbs up. You are no, not defined by those things. Those things are transient. They will mean nothing. You know, I, when you think about it, when you, when you, when you, in, in your hospital bed, right? You ain't thinking about no, well, some people do. The first thing they do is turn to Facebook. Oh, you gotta tell, I'm out of surgery. I'm still sitting here under anesthesia and you gotta take a picture. No shade, but you know, that that's, um, but, but work on who you are, where you are with what you have, right? And when, when you get yourself together, you already got a posse. I mean, if I think about that, I'm at the, the, the tail end, the apex of literally thousands of people, ancestors that came before me, some that were in shackles and chains and some that were free and they existed so that I can be here today, right? When, when I think about it like that, I that's a that's an awesome awesome responsibility. So I got my whole lineage that is like cheering me on. I, how dare me ignore that? As if the thumbs up is that that we just scroll by like I see a picture. Uh, you know they have a vested interest in and in me being right here right now. They have a vested interest in you showing up right here and right now. No mistakes. This is not a mistake. They got a vested interest in you. So we got to show up. So um, we can reject it. <laughs> we can repeat our rejected parents' life experience, right? Let me, let me, let me go through this um, because uh, this stuff is so juicy. Like when we reject a parent, it's say for instance, if you reject either your mother because you think... Um, 
look because you think she was not playing with a full deck or you think she drove your father away or you think whatever it is, if you reject your mother, oh, that's problems, that's, that's issue. We got to find a way to make peace. That's your responsibility is to find a way to make peace, to see the love in them. I, but uh, let, me, let me just read this. Um, when we reject a parent, a strange symmetry linking us can occur, right? We can unwittingly walk in his or her shoes. Stop the presses, right? Stop the freaking presses. Can you imagine that the very same judgment that you have against your parent becomes what you are? Let, let, let me let me read on because because I want to I want to I want to use his words because I want to I want to be clear. What we judge as unacceptable or intolerable in our parent can repeat in our life. You ever see? Oh my gosh! I um. I don't even know. I don't even know if he found his parent intolerable or whatever. But um, I know a guy whose father was a drunk, right? His father was an uh, alcoholic. Um, no shade. I, I'm not trying to throw shade, but I'm just trying to describe the level of his alcoholism. I can remember seeing this man so drunk, about to drive home, right? But he would be so drunk that when he went to fall, the natural thing for a person to do is to put their hands out to block their fall, right? I saw this man go face down and he just seemed like he never even prepared for the fact that he was about to hit right? I didn't see no hands go up. That's, I, you know, I was walking down the street um, a couple of months ago, and I hit a thing, and I was praising God because um, cause I hit something as I was walking, and, um, and I didn't even realize it because I was just, you know, I was looking in another direction. My foot hit the, hit a bump in the curb, and I was going down and I didn't even have time to think about it. I caught myself before my face hit the pavement. So it wasn't even a conscious reaction on me. It was an unconscious spirit steps in and spirit blocks or breaks my fall. It was amazing. I was like, whoa, I was praising because I realized that there have been people who have fallen and had some major falls, right? Had some major falls that 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 landed them someplace else in the hospital. This man used to be was so drunk one time we were standing uh we were standing there watching him as he walked out and um but it was a snowy day which was fortunate. But he was so drunk that he when he went to fall, he didn't even put his hands up to break his fall, right? Uh, we had to run out there and pull him up because he was just face down in the snow, like, like I don't know, it was like a zombie. Anyway, <clears throat> he had four children. One of them is a, just like his dad. I mean, just like him. I'm not saying that this son rejected his father. I don't know. I don't know if he judged him or stood in judgment, but I know that he has a son that's, and, and alcoholism runs in the family. Sometimes we see stuff that runs in the family, but it's saying that what you reject in your parents, you sometimes unconsciously repeat yourself, Right. You have a mother that you think is a liar, but you can't help but lie yourself, right? You have um, you have all kind of stuff that could be going on. What you judge, what you reject, what you find intolerable, unacceptable in a parent, 
sometimes becomes just who you are. Right? The nag, the judgment. I mean, I'm, this is what he's saying here. Um, he says it can feel like an unwelcome inheritance. Now I may be talking out the side of my neck. Let me, let me, let me go on a little bit. We assume the opposite is true. The more we distance ourselves from our parents, the less likely we are to live similar lives and repeat their challenges. However, the converse appears to be truer. He says, when we distance ourselves from them, we tend to become more like them and often lead lives similar to theirs. Is that like newsflash? And some of y'all are saying, I'm not like, I'm not like that. Some of y'all are like, yeah, you, I'm not like that. Huh? My, uh, my, my, somebody used to tell me that the reason why me and my dad used to butt heads so much was because I was so much like him. And I was like, I'm not like that. <laughs> I'm not like that. I, you know, I could, I could own that I'm like my mother, but I was like, oh, I'm not like my dad. But, but in some ways I am. And that's not a bad thing. It just, you know, I, I said something to somebody the other day and they, they seemed like they got a little self-conscious about it. And I was like, I, you know, it, it, I, I can say now, no shade. I didn't even, even intend any shade on that. It was just, I just, so I, I'm, I, I find things funny that I don't perceive as hurtful, but somebody else might, right? Um, you know, uh, I got a neighbor and she is, you know, she's in her 60s. And, and I, I, used, I tell people all the time, I hate when people say to me, oh, you sassy or jazzy. I said, that's what you say to an old person. I'm not jazzy, right? But she can come out of the house sometimes, especially on hot days. And I'll be like, whoa, hot mama. I ain't, it's no shade. Cause I, ain't, you know what? I ain't trying to tell her that she need to dress in. I am one that is against this idea of age appropriate clothing, right? And, you know, uh, you know, look, it's, it's a lot of times you, you know, you want to talk to somebody about the reactions. Don't get mad when somebody says something to you with that outfit on. Don't get mad. Just know you that when you put that outfit on, you want to expect that, right? No shade, wear whatever the heck you want to. But I just, you know, all of us think it's our responsibility to, if, if somebody come out, you know, like come out in her brown panties, I'm going to have her, I'm, I'm going to be out there like, you know, get, and I do, I do just like that. I'm silly as heck. I'll be like, whoa, girl. What I said, work it. <laughs> I just be out there clowning. Cause, cause how dare me? Look. How dare you walk past the color purple and not notice it, right? You, when you, <laughs> that's my philosophy. I'm, I'm going, now she may get, she may, I don't know if she get offended or not, but she usually laughs at me because I'm so silly about it. I ain't telling her to go put no, I ain't telling her to go do nothing, right? But I'm, I'm sure going, I, I got to show enough, like stand there and be like, yes. Right? Yes, do that. <laughs> do that all day long. So, so I know that there are so many people that will, you know, want to police the universe, right? Police the universe. That's what they want to do. They want to tell you what you should or should not wear, blah, 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 blah. Right? I ain't that girl. I'm, a, I'm just going to be like, yeah. <laughs> that's that's me that's me i you know uh i'm i want to celebrate celebrate <laughs> so um so let me let me um oh let me ah oh, he, he says in here if for example this is what he goes on to say if for example our father is rejected for being an alcoholic or a failure we can drink or fail just like him by unconsciously following in his footsteps, 
we establish a covert bond with him by sharing what is perceived as the negative in him. So sometimes, oh, sometimes our taking on the stuff that was judged, the persona, whatever, that is, that is this, this bonding kind of thing that has been done. And, you know, sometimes we don't, I, I guess, unconscious, we don't even know that we are doing it. And so, um, so let me start off by, uh, I, I realize I'm getting down to the bottom of that. I'm going to try to be, um, I, 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 I think sometime I'm going to be a better steward with my time, but um, this is just sometimes it's so good. Um, this is, this next example is by a guy named Kevin, right? My, I got a brother named Kevin. Um, this is about a guy named Kevin. Kevin's secret bond with his father. Now, oh, 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 I can tell y'all that my brother Kevin looks and acts just like my dad, but I don't really have, like my dad um, was such a, a, a good man. And I could say that even when he was alive, it's not like some, some, you know, idea that I had after the fact. He is he was a good man. Now, there was a lot of booger bear stuff in him with his kids. He was critical and all of that other stuff. But just, just, I mean, just a stand up, a stand up person. So I want to read this. I want to, I want to share this with y'all. At 36, Kevin was proud of the fact that he held an upper management position in a top 10 internet company. However, he was worried that his drinking problem would destroy his life. I'm afraid I'm going to have a breakdown, fail, and lose everything I've created. Now, um, I, I, could, I, could, I could stop right there for a minute, but let me, let me just kind of carry on. So Kevin's core language, remember, our core language comes from our worst fear, right? If you think about what is my worst fear, what's the worst thing that can happen? Somebody might find out or what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, somebody might reject me. What's the worst thing that can happen? I could lose all the stuff that I've worked so hard to. It, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? We, we've got to ask ourselves, what's the worst thing that could happen for us? right? Not somebody else. What's the worst thing that can happen to you? So Kevin's worst, his core language was, is I'll have a breakdown, fail, and lose everything I've created. I need to go back and, uh, you know, there was a, I, I think I said what my core fear was when it came down to success the first day we started doing this. And um, I, I don't need to go back and revisit it, but even as I think about it, sometimes it, it, you know, it changes a little bit because we, I get to narrow down and really be present in what, what it is that I'm dealing with. This is, this is the question that you ask yourself. What, and, and this could be in life, in a relationship, in success, in any of these things, in any of these areas, what's the worst thing that could happen? And that gets you to your core fear, your core statement, your core language. And so he is, he is, is I'll have a breakdown, fail, and lose everything I created. So here's his history. In his family, Kevin's father had done exactly that. A successful Boston attorney, Kevin's father had become an alcoholic, lost his job, and then lost his health. The family eventually lost their home. At that point, Kevin was 10. His mother moved him away from his father. Kevin often heard her say, your father is no good. He destroyed our lives. Kevin rarely saw his father after that. His father died early of liver failure. Kevin was 25 at the time. That's when his own drinking began to take off. Now, when you think about that, um, 
Ooh. Ooh, the reasons, the reasons why, the reasons behind the things that we do. Sometimes we think that our drinking is a coping mechanism, or we think that um, the self-destructive behavior, whether it's gambling or drinking or, you know, um, whatever it may be, we think that sometimes it is just, you know, this is just what I choose to do. Or um, uh, what is it? Alcoholism runs in my family, right? That's, that's kind of the the, the paintbrush we try to color it with without saying that, you know, secretly it's our way of being closer to the parent that we rejected. Because now I'm sharing something. I'm sharing something with them. Kevin remembered, um, let, me, let, me, let me read on. Kevin remembered hearing about an incident that occurred when his father was 12. He and his nine-year-old brother were climbing on an abandoned barn when his younger brother fell off the roof and died. That's traumatic. That's some traumatic stuff. Kevin's father was blamed for his own brother's death. You know better. You knew better. You're the older right? You're whatever it is. Um, so not only would he hear that from other people, but he might, yes, take that on himself and say, mm, I am to blame. Now, uh, I want to, I, I, I want to deal with that, but let me, let me, let me keep reading. Kevin now understood how his father feeling responsible for his brother's death might not have been able to sustain living a full life when his brother did not have a full life to live. Yeah, I got to tell you this little story real quick. I probably have talked about this on here before. Um, Oh, I can't even tell you what year. Oh, yes, I can. It was it was 20 some years ago because my nephew was now, is he 23, something like that. Um, so it was it was it was a while back ago. Um, my brother used to live um, uh, downstairs from me. And um, one morning I was going out and I had this German shepherd at the time, beautiful, beautiful dog, but he was always chasing after something. I mean, I would have to get him because he chased after skunks. He chased after cats. He chased anything that wasn't like him. He actually chased after dogs, right? Squirrels. It didn't matter. My dog chased it. It was just who he was. Oh, good. I mean, good, but don't, don't cross his path. I mean, he'd take off one and pshh, right anyway one morning I was going to work I had to be there at a certain time and I was running late what I would do is I go and usually just open the door scream his name he comes running in because he needs to be in the house when I'm gone to work so this particular morning I go out there I call his name and I see him he's in the garage um what he's doing in the garage I don't know because he doesn't go in the garage what are you doing come on here and I had to call him. I, now, usually he's ready on the spot. I had a compliance time set for him. That's why I have a hard time dealing with my uh, deaf dog. I had a compliance time. Like, don't, you know, you know how we do one, two, three. It's, it's not even like that because he didn't understand the one, two, three concept. But, you know, when I call you, you come, right? So, um, so this particular day, he wasn't coming. As a matter of fact, he runs out of the garage and on one side of my car and he runs back in on the other. And then he's doing this thing. And I'm like, if you don't get in here right now, because I got to be at work. And so he finally reluctantly goes back in the house. Now, in my mind, I knew that something was amiss, right? Because normally he comes just like that. I knew something must have been wrong, but I didn't have time to deal with whatever it was. Good morning, Sandra. I didn't have time to deal with it. So I go out there and I get in my car and I do, you know, I got this whole thing. I had stuff in my hand. I open the car door. I get in. 
I throw the stuff over in the seat next to me, come back with my key, turn the thing, put the car into reverse. And as I'm backing up, I, I hit the gas, backing up because now I'm running late. I'm already running late. I, I hit the, the thing to back up and the car goes, right? And so I didn't immediately put on my brake. I kept backing up. And when I looked up forward, there was a cat that was there twitching because I had run over it. Oh my God, y'all. I started screaming. I started screaming to the top of my lungs. Oh my God. I saw the blood starting to flow from it. And I was just beside myself. I was, I, I can't even tell y'all how distraught I was in that moment. But as I'm sitting there screaming, my brother's hand reaches in the car and he grabs me and pulls me towards the door. And he's like, you know, calling my name. And, you know, it's like, and he says, look, he says, I'll get it up. Don't worry about it. Go ahead and go. And, you know, it's like, okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm, you know, he's like, I got it. So I continue to back out of the driveway. Um, I, I start to drive towards, but I'm still hysterical. I'm still screaming, but I'm, now I'm trying to drive to wherever it is that I go. I, t I stop at the stop sign. And as I turned the corner, I heard this voice that said, you know, like, <laughs> You know, it's like um, I forget how it how it uh, the the first word that that I heard, but it said, "Don't wax yourself." And I'm thinking, wax myself? Don't wax myself. It says you can neither give life nor take life. That is on me. You are merely a means to an end. End of connection, end of communication. I'm sitting there looking around like, who said that? Who said that? Now, oh, y'all. And as I drove on, I'm like thinking, don't wax myself. And you know, waxing is an old, old world term that people put on layers and layers of wax to get a certain shine. It ain't even something you hear in current vernacular today. Don't wax yourself. I was like, who says that? Who says that? <laughs> but then, you know, this, this, this idea that you can neither give life nor take life, that is it, that's based on God, is God's timing. This idea that we are at fault for somebody else's death or somebody else's demise is wrong. You can neither give life nor take life. That is on me. You are merely a means to an end. I was like, good, googly moogly. Newsflash, right? And a lot of times we get caught up blaming ourselves for stuff. And this is across the board. You know, we, we blame ourselves with somebody else lost a job or we blame ourselves that somebody else had this experience or that experience. We get caught up in the blame. Y'all, we are merely a means to an end that things occur they occur because they are supposed to occur. I, 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 and we play a part. Sure, we may play a part, but we are not the cause. There is this, I love the way um, when Miriam Williamson, she talks about it. She says that, that we almost like we're in a classroom. And we get an individualized curriculum that is meant just for us. 
right? Nobody else, just for us. What you hear, what you perceive, what you go through is specially made for you. And it is made to bless you. It is always made to elevate you, not to take you down, right? Don't get stuck there. Uh, that, you know, I talk about that rap song all the time. I went through hell without getting hot, right? I went to Vietnam without getting shot. It's not for you to stop. When you find yourself in hell, the, 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 the directive is don't stop. You find yourself in a sticky situation, don't stop. Sometimes we set up, you know, we set down a blanket and have a picnic in our misery. No, no, no. It's not time for you to have a pity party. When you are in hot water, you keep moving. And you got to figure out what it means to do that, right? Oh, man, my brother, this happened, right? there. And, and I get it because there's this, there's this thing of, you know, we always ask ourselves, what could I have done different? What could I have done? What could I have done? I, I get, I took care of my mother. I took care of my father. I was there, you know, beside my brother. I mean, there's always this question, what could I have done? But God has already told me that the, the end is not up to you. That it is coming is not up to you. This is part of, this was set in motion before this life came into being. This, this, all of this is set in motion already. So that the fact that it ends is, and, and that you were there, you know, that becomes your burden to bear. That becomes what you have to walk through, move through, heal from, right? So I remember thinking, you know, after my mother was, um, after my mother passed, I was like, oh, I should have done this and I should have done that. Would it have changed anything? No. Would it have changed the fact that when it was her time to go, she had to go? No. No. So you can sit up and you can hold on and you can guilt trip about stuff that happened. Oh, you know this. and uh, It is the opportunity for you to grow from that. What would growth look like? I mean, sometimes you got to ask yourself, if, if, if this is the, the, the cause or if this is whatever, oh, what would it look like, right? So here, here, let me finish reading this and, and then I could get off of here. In a flash of insight during our session, session together, Kevin connected his own self-destruction similarly. We're back to his, him and his dad um, being, you know, alcoholics. He realized that by dying early, he would only further the devastation in his family. Understanding the burden his father carried Kevin could feel a profound love for him, right? His, his father was carrying the burden, thinking that somehow he was responsible for his brother dying. So, so you know, he's carrying that burden. He's going through, he's trying to make it, blah, blah, blah. It just seems like it gets too much for him to carry. He uses alcoholism ends up dying, blah, blah, blah. Um, not saying that trying to blow it off, but, you know, um, now here it is, his son, who is now on the same path of destruction, finds himself with Mark Wolin. He says, understanding the bar burden his father carried, Kevin could feel, the prof feel a profound love for him. Now I got compassion for you, because now I'm, I'm getting that it wasn't just you know, that it was all of this in your life, all the trauma that you've experienced. I could have compassion for you rather than blame for you. Um, it filled him with compassion and he now felt sorry for pushing him away a long time ago. He was, you know, but he was young. He was 12. And so, um, you know, it was, it was also his mother's, you know, his mother's responsibility to, to make sure that that connection um, stayed intact. So just by making the connection, Kevin was able to make major life changes, right? What's my excuse? My dad 
was was still feeling some guilt and some angst about his brother. What's my excuse, right? Um, he stopped drinking, and for the first time, he felt supported by an image his father by his uh, image of his father at his back. Right, my dad has got my back. Like I'm setting him free in my mind. Now his energy is free to stand up in my life. He now felt excited about the life that lay ahead of him. That, you know, sometimes it's just bringing awareness to our parents, right? We can reject them, but sometimes it is, let me look at their life and see that it, it wasn't no crystal stair. Sometimes it is just opening to compassion or opening to a new awareness about what could have been their reality that shakes something loose in us. I can have compassion because what I realized was my mother was, had, had, her, had been disconnected from her mother, had felt abandoned and abused. I can, I can have compassion for what she went through and how she looked at the world in, in the way that she did. I could feel compassion for that. And in feeling compassion for it, then embrace her in a different way. I didn't hold anything against my mother when she was here. I, you know, my mother and I were just, mm, we were like, you know, ah. But even just bringing that to the awareness is like um, taking some straws off there, off of her back. Um, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, it's taking some straws off of there. So how can you, you know, be more generous, even if your mother is still here? Because, you know, sometimes we think that this is not, you know, like we need to go and I forgive you over them. The work to do is your work to do. Do it on the cushion. Do it while you're driving. Do it, you know, in, in the spaces and places where you go. That's the place you do that. It's internal. It's internal. If I set you free in my heart, you are free. Oh, my goodness. So, y'all, it's time for me to go. I thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. This was so good. This is so good. Um, tomorrow we get to um, go into the next uh, section. I'm, I'm making some progress here. All right. So, I um, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I will be here tomorrow. God willing, and the creek don't rise. Tomorrow is Friday, is when he would say. And uh, yeah, so we'll be here. I'll be here tomorrow. And um, thank you for uh, tuning in today. Y'all yeah, know, um, hey, Tracy, thank you. You have an amazing, great day too. Um, blessings to you. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see y'all tomorrow. All right. Thank you. And yay. <laughs> All right. So I'm out of here. I get to, oh, I'll be back on at 11 o'clock to talk to Dr. Brown. And we're going to be talking about, um, when he asked, I said, we're going to be talking about epigenetics. So uh, yes. All right. See you then.